and he's beginning to kiss us. Welcome, everybody. My name is Paul Pope, and I have the honor of introducing the host of today's um, presentation, not the presenter, although I actually know him. And, you know, we have, uh, we, we always think about future generations here, but now we have the next generation beyond the future generation. <laughs> I got a little here. As a, as a, oh, grandpa, soon to be a second grandpa, a little soon maybe here. But um, so this is uh, brought to you by the Strauss Center, and the Strauss Center has a program thanks to a generous family called the Brumleys, called the Brumley Fellowship. So we have Brumley Fellows, and I'm a mentor to a Brumley Fellow, and he talked to me early in the year about somebody that we bring in to talk about that the matter of proliferation. I, I suggested. Andy, I'll let him introduce Andy in just a second, but just to tell you a little bit about Niels Holtz, who is the Brumley Fellow. I'm talking about Niels is a uh, journalist. He grew up in California with the school in Oregon, um, the, in the town or near a town that thinks it's as weird as Austin, but actually isn't. Um, <laughs> and uh, then he, he did um, a two-year stint from 17 to 19, is that right? Uh, in Morocco in the Peace Corps. Um, and I can tell you a lot about Niels, but the thing I would just like to tell you is, as a professor that makes me very satisfied is Niels came here with the general idea. He, he brought a lot with him in terms of his own personal experience. Then he brought a set of interests. Then he took a bunch of classes. And now he's leaving with a job in that area. Okay, so we always consider that a success. So Niels, would you come up and introduce our speaker? Thanks. Thanks, Professor Hope. I love, I've never been introduced like that before. It was fun. I, I kept listening to all that going, yeah, he's here. He's here. I'd like to meet that guy. Wow. All right. So thank you everyone for coming. It's great to see so many people here and, and the next generation as well. You got to get them started early, Emma. Uh, so thank you guys for coming out. It is my great pleasure to welcome today's, uh, uh, welcome you to today's talk on countering weapons of mass destruction, uh, featuring the indomitable Andrew Weber. Mr. Weber has spent the last 30 years working on this important issue. And he has been present for most, if, if not all, of the major non-proliferation victories of the last 30 years. Uh, someone, I won't, I won't say who, uh, uh, like Mr. Weber to uh, the Forrest Gump of non-proliferation. He's been, he's been present at every major event for the last 30 years, always sort of in the, in the corner of the frame. You just see him in, in the pictures, you go, oh, yeah, I know that guy. So I'll go into Mr. Weber's impressive bio in just a minute, but first I want to take a minute to uh, thank the fine folks over at the Strauss Center uh, for making this happen. So uh, Professor Pope, thank you. Uh, uh, Professor Infoden, uh, uh, not here, and then, uh, and then uh, Carolyn Dockery and all the other center staff, thank you very much for putting this together and making it happen. Uh, this is, as Professor Pope said, the latest talk in the Brumley Speaker Series, which is part of the Strauss Center's Brumley Next Generation Fellowship Program. Uh, that's what I'm doing here. That's how I've got the picture. Uh, so I'm a counterterrorism Brumley Fellow. I'm working on a project under the mentorship of Professor Pope. Uh, and we have him to thank, as he said, for putting me in touch with Andy. So, all right, put the bio on Mr. Weber. So Andy Weber is an independent consultant and senior fellow at the Council on Strategic Risks, a nonpartisan nonprofit think tank. He has dedicated his professional life to countering nuclear, chemical, and biological threats and strengthening global health security. Mr. Weber's 30 years of U.S. government service included five and a half years as President Obama's Assistant Secretary of Defense for nuclear, chemical, and biological defense programs. He was a driving force behind the Nun Lugar cooperative threat <coughs> reduction efforts to remove weapons-grade uranium from Kazakhstan and Georgia, as well as nuclear-capable MiG-29 aircraft from Moldova. He also worked to reduce biological weapon threats and destroy Libyan and Syrian chemical stockpiles. In addition, he coordinated, the, <clears throat> he coordinated U.S. leadership of the international Ebola response for the Department of State. Prior to joining the Pentagon as advisor for threat reduction policy in December of 1996, Mr. Weber was posted abroad as a foreign service officer in Saudi Arabia, Germany, Kazakhstan, and Hong Kong. Mr. Weber is currently a strategic advisor for Ginkgo Bioworks. I apologize if I didn't get that pronunciation right. And a consultant for DARPA, Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, and others. He serves on the boards of the Arms Control Association and Healthcare Ready and the James Martin Center for Nonproliferation Studies International Advisory Council. Mr. Weber taught a course on force and diplomacy at the Georgetown University Graduate School of Foreign Service for seven years and was a senior fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School's Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs. He graduated from Cornell University and holds a Master of Science in Foreign Service from Georgetown University. 
He is also a member on the Council of Foreign Relations. So without any further ado, let's give a big round of applause and a warm welcome to Fine. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Um, wow. That's a long bio. I guess I'm old. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I, I tell people re, uh, lately that I just really do three things nuclear weapons, chemical weapons, and biological weapons. And all of them were pretty obscure until the last uh, five or six weeks. And they've kind of risen uh, in the news. Um, but I want to share some of my policy views, but also some of my uh, experiences during my privileged 30-year uh, career in the federal, federal government. And I'm, I'm excited that you're all um, leaning towards some form of public service um, in, your, in your careers. Um, so I had a life-changing event. I was flying back from, from Germany to Washington for consultations. And there was an article in the Wall Street Journal. This was in February of 1992. And the headline was, American Embassy Almaty looking for diplomats who find Paris a bore. <laughs> and, and I said, ah, and it was all about the opening of the brand new US Embassy in this new country called Kazakhstan on the 26th floor of the Hotel Kazakhstan, the old Windsor Hotel. And, uh, and they had over 1,200 nuclear weapons. And it was the land of Genghis Khan. And it just sounded like a fascinating place. So the next day, I went into my, my career development officer and, and said, can I go to Kazakhstan for my next assignment? And they were so happy that I actually, somebody with a pulse <laughs> was, willing, was willing to go to um, uh, one of the 14 new embassies that we had just opened and it was you know not easy staffing them because there was not a lot of infrastructure in the place and so they they uh, said absolutely and uh, i spent a year in russian language training and then in the summer of um, 1993 um, i got to the beautiful uh, tian shan mountains uh, in kazakhstan um, near the border with uh, china and kyrgyzstan and a couple of months after I arrived, a few things happened. One is China tested a nuclear weapon at their lots more nuclear weapons test site in Western China, which is not far over the border. And people were concerned about radiation from the venting of that test. And so they sent me up into the, the mountains to collect uh, soil and, and plant and, and uh, water uh, snow samples. Uh, so we sent them back to the laboratory for, for testing. Um, the other thing that happened is my automobile mechanic, uh, his name was Slava, he asked me if I'd be interested in buying some uranium. <laughs> uh, and it was a crazy time. Uh, there were all kinds of scams going on at that time. The Soviet Union had fallen apart. And um, so I, I said, well, I'd like to know more, but uh, <laughs> and this led to a series of events. Um, I was introduced uh, to a factory director from a, a place called Uskmenogorsk, Uskmenogorsk in northeastern Kazakhstan, um, and he was a former Soviet uh, submariner. Um, his name was Vitaly Mete. Part of what I want to stress today is how much people matter. Um, um, so he invited me after our first meeting, um, he invited me on a hunting trip up in northern Kazakhstan. And of course, I said yes. And uh, we went on a moose and elk hunting trip and bonded in, in the naked banya. Uh, it's, a, it's a Cossack and Russian tradition. And um, over a period of a few months, I was able to get more information I said, look, you know, we're potentially interested in, in buying this uranium, but we need to know, you know more about it. You know, what's the enrichment level? How much do you have? Because we didn't know that this factory that produced low enriched um, uranium pellets for the nuclear power industry, that we didn't think they had any highly enriched uranium. 
uh, based on our, our intelligence at the time. Um, and then one day, um, after I had been pressing him for details, um, this uh, former KGB uh, border guard, Colonel uh, Corbacher, um, invited me out to a place on the outskirts of town in this apartment complex. And um, there was an office. They were selling uh, military equipment for hunting. So night vision goggles and all the Soviet uh, paraphernalia. And he said, Andy, let's take a walk. And it was a snowy day. Winter came early that year. And um, we walked into the around the courtyard of this apartment complex. And he said, Andy, I have a message for you from Vitaly. And he handed me a little piece of paper about this big, a lid and a half. And, and we kept walking. And I looked down and it said, U-235, 90%. 600 kg, and I, like you, I gulped <laughs> and uh, folded it up and put it in my pocket and kept walking. And I, uh, that night I duly reported this all back to Washington, and um, there, let's just say there was a, a, a big gas, but also a, uh, a lot of skepticism that this was even possible. Um, that's a lot of weapons grade uranium enough for dozens of nuclear weapons. Um, so President Nazarbayev was visiting President Clinton the following February. I went back uh, to, to be involved in that visit. And we had a secret meeting in Blair House where President Nazarbayev was staying um, to talk about this. And, and uh, during the course of that discussion, he agreed to allow, uh, to arrange for me to visit the plan to inspect the material uh, together with a technical ex expert from Oak Ridge National Laboratory, uh, whose name was Elwood Gift. And in March of, of 93, or of, of 94, um, it was snowing hard. We, we flew up to Uskimenogorsk um, and we were given a tour of the factory and then taken, taken into this vault area that was protected by a, a good padlock. There was a militia woman there with a nine millimeter Makara and sort of almost like prison doors. And it was literally protected by this padlock that you'd see in an antique shop or a Civil War era padlock. And she opened it up and, and the factory director Vitaly um, let us um, take samples from these buckets. So it was a big room like, like this, but bigger. And there was sort of a, a low plywood uh, platform uh, with these buckets, stainless steel buckets of different types and sizes spread out um, so they wouldn't reach a critical mass. And we were able to, uh, to take samples and um, and measurements and confirmed that indeed there were 600 kilograms of uranium 235 enriched uh, to, to um, 90 percent. So this is weapons usable material. And then we reported that back to Washington, and that really did uh, get quite a reaction. But the first report was that ah, you know, it's probably just a scam, but this this got their attention and it. Uh, led to the development of a tiger team in the Department of Defense, Department of Energy, Department of State, uh, put together a plan to remove this material and fly it back to the United States. Um, so this was the material during that uh, secret visit in March of uh, 1994. You see it's just metal rods. Um, you know, I picked up a, a um, pure uranium metal ingot and I'm, whoa, it's like, oh yeah, it's a heavy metal. That's why they call it heavy metal. But um, there was something of it's just the plainness, the banality of metal and knowing what was possible. There was a picture outside of a mushroom cloud uh, for my talk, hopefully. <laughs> so we organized um, a secret air rift um, in the late fall of, uh, of 1994. Um, a team uh, from the Department of Energy, uh, mostly from Oak Ridge, and, and some military personnel 
I spent about six weeks on the ground packaging the material in uh, special containers that were approved for moving, moving fissile material. Um, and we loaded the material, the, these barrels, onto Soviet era uh, big heavy trucks and had them at the factory. They were mobile. They were most vulnerable in that form because somebody could steal the whole truck and drive off with it. And at three o'clock in the morning, um, sort of for tactical surprise, it was a, a terrible cold night, uh, black ice on the roads, snow, rain mix. And uh, we, we had a secure convoy from the factory to the airport. The trucks were sliding on the black ice. And I was thinking, oh my God, I don't wanna have to report back to Washington that one of the trucks slid off a bridge and it's floating down the Irtish River. But um, thankfully, we made it to the airport. They're good driving on snow in that part of the world. And um, we were met by a C-5 aircraft. It was the longest flight in the history of that uh, C-5 Galaxy aircraft. And the material was flown back directly without um, uh, landing anywhere because of the cargo uh, with four aerial refuelings en route to uh, Dover, Delaware, and then by truck to Tennessee, where it was um stored uh temporarily and then blended down for the nucle uh, nuclear power industry but that was called project sapphire and it was really the first example of removing uh, weapons usable nuclear material from a country at that time there were over 50 countries that had significant quantities of weapons usable uh, plutonium and, and highly enriched uranium and it, it was the first in a series of, of uh, sort of clean out operations. Um, now there are fewer than 20 countries that have this material. So it, it, it really did create a momentum of its own. It was written about in a book called The Dead Hand by David Hoffman. And um, I have a contract with some Hollywood producers to make it into a, a streaming series or, or a, a feature film. Um, don't ask me who's going to play me because I haven't done cast them. Um, so that was my exposure to, to nuclear materials. Um, and then I'm going to move to bio. This was also in Kazakhstan. And, and the success of our secret, and then when that Project Sapphire was completed, we, we publicly announced it at the Pentagon and in and, and Almaty simultaneously. Um, and that generated a lot of goodwill and trust between our governments. We had also learned, um, so it was probably the largest intelligence failure of the Cold War, that the Soviet Union had an enormous biological weapons program. And we had uh, one defector came out to the UK in 1989 and another one to the United States in 1992. And we learned a lot of details about how big their biological weapons program was which was completely banned by the Biological Weapons Convention. Um, in this building in northern Kazakhstan, um, the president again invited a small US team, which I led to uh, visit the facility on a secret visit. Um, it's two football fields long. Um, and the entire, so, so this, this is the bottom of a four-story high fermenter or bioreactor. One of 10. The entire fermentation hall was in biosafety level four high containment. So they wore spacesuits and hooked up to breathable airports. Um, this facility was capable of producing during a wartime mobilization period of about eight months 300 <coughs> metric tons of anthrax. That's a lot. Um, you know, less than a gram paralyzed Washington sent by the mail to, to the U.S. Senate uh, and some media organizations. Um, my, my thought that the first day of the visit, the, the scale was so large, it was just evil is the right word. Um, and in, in front, those are bunkers. Those are reportedly hardened to withstand a nuclear blast. And that's where they would load the agent um, onto weapons. Um, now, uh, subsequently, we did a, a project with the government of Kazakhstan through the Nunn-Luger Cooperative Threat Reduction Program, 
the Department of Defense funds, and we safely over a period of years, bit by bit, destroyed that factory of anthrax. And um, if you were to go there today, you'd probably just see snow or white field or in summertime, a green field um, completely destroyed. Um, as part of that same trip, we also went to the Soviet Union's open air biological weapons test site at a place called Vazirstania Island, which is in the RLC between Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan. And there they tested things like smallpox, um, anthrax, tularemia, plague, <coughs> Venezuelan equine encephalitis. And in a single test, they would use about 80 to 100 monkeys and put them out on a test grid, fly over, expose them to Asian, and then bring them back into a containment laboratory and observe the onset of death to determine the effectiveness of their uh, biological weapons. Um, they also, the Soviet military buried over 100 tons of anthrax on this island. They moved it in 1988 by rail from uh, behind the uh, Lake Baikal, and then by ship out to the island, uh, dug 11 pits and, and improperly decontaminated the anthrax, put them in the pits, covered them up. And during this trip, we took core samples and determined that there were viable anthrax spores um, still after all those years because it had been deep enough underground to be protected from ultraviolet light and, and, uh, and the heat of the sun. Um, so we did another project with the government of Uzbekistan to redig those pits and thoroughly decontaminate um, the anthrax that was left on the island. So especially after 9-11, we became very concerned about um, biological terrorism. Um, there had been a case of chemical terrorism in, in Japan uh, in 1995, the Amshin Rikyo cult uh, launched an attack on, on the Tokyo Metro with sarin gas. But they also had a biological weapons program that was, we didn't learn about until later by interviewing the prisoners, the scientists on death row. Um, they had launched two anthrax attacks, but didn't kill anybody because they used the wrong strain of anthrax. It was a non-virulent strain. Um, so I worry most about, about um, biological weapons. Um, for a lot of reasons. Um, we found that Al Qaeda had a, an anthrax facility in uh, Kandahar uh, or um, Karnak Farms in Afghanistan that we interdicted in the fall of 2001. And now with COVID, we've seen what even a relatively low mortality virus can do. It's less than 1% mortality. Uh, something like smallpox has 30%. SARS-1, 60% uh, mortality. So imagine now it's possible a bioengineered weapon that a state could make. Um, there was a group in, in Alberta, Canada that synthesized the horsepox virus uh, by just ordering the, the DNA parts, the RNA parts, um, base pairs in, uh, um, from a company that, that produces it. And in six months for about $100,000, they were able to produce live horsepox virus which was an extinct virus. And um, so imagine you could do that with variola virus that causes smallpox. Um, so we're in a new world in terms of biological threat. I think uh, COVID has shown the vulnerability of countries like the United States to, to uh, biological events and, and the disruption that it caused. Um, and then the, the technologies are just becoming democratized and more accessible. And, before, you know, we could read DNA, we could do genetic sequencing, that's gotten faster and cheaper. And with CRISPR-Cas9, we can edit it. And more recently, we're, we're, uh, you can buy commercially available DNA synthesizers to write DNA. And so that, and all these recipes, the genetic sequences for the most dangerous viruses are publicly available on, on GenBank and other databases. So that is a new, Threat that we haven't quite figured out how to deal with the ability of anybody to, to uh, produce any virus, any pathogen. It's coming in the next five or 10 years. 
So one of the things that the Council on Strategic Risks started working on in 2018 and 19 um, is we think the vision should be making bioweapons obsolete. And, and it should be a strategy of deterrence by denial. So deny the effects of a biological weapons attack by having good early warning, detection, characterization, and rapid countermeasures platforms like the mRNA vaccine. So uh, our adversaries would realize that biological weapons won't be that effective and they'll pursue something else. So that's what we've been advocating for. And, and the Biden administration has more or less adopted this policy of uh, making the world safe and secure from all biological threats, deliberate, accidental, and, and natural. Um, we're proposing to invest uh, $20 billion a year, at 10 at the Department of Health and Human Services, 10 at the Department of Defense over the next decade. And we think we can really take bioweapons off the table. Um, it's gonna take a lot of effort and I hope we don't lose interest um, and we can sustain funding in, in this, but um, uh, we, we've got to do it. I mean, this is our sort of once in a generation chance. I also did a little work on uh, chemical weapons. Um, in fact, earlier in my career, um, in the late 1980s, uh, Colonel Gaddafi, the living leader, had been developing chemical weapons at a place called Lapta. And then fast forward, um, Gaddafi's overthrown, and we learned that there was a cache of, uh, of chemical weapons remaining um, that had, they had not declared when they joined the Chemical Weapons Convention in, in uh, the winter of 2003, 2004. And I had the opportunity to, to visit, to celebrate the destruction of the last of 517 artillery shells that were filled with mustard gas. Um, in, in addition to, to eight uh, large bombs and, and rockets. And this was a project in the middle of Libya. We had to go from Tripoli by fixed swing and then by MIA helicopters out to the site. And uh, the head Libyan chemical engineer, um, and this, again, the, the importance of people, he, um, after this day-long visit, we're flying back to Tripoli and he says, Mr. Andy, can I can I talk to you guys? For sure. He said, he said, I want I want you to know that that I helped Colonel Gaddafi make these horrible chemical weapons. And he said, today is the proudest day of my life to be able to have led the team that that destroyed the last of them. It, it, it's really profound that that the people who made Stepan Gorsk, the anthrax factory, they dismantled it on contract to the Department of Defense. And the same was the case with Libya. Um, so that was an amazing experience for me because I couldn't previously, uh, wasn't able to visit Libya. And this was in February of 2014, not too long ago. And about the same time, um, we started to become very concerned about Syria's very large uh, chemical weapons uh, stockpile. In 2011, when the unrest started happening in Syria, civil unrest, peaceful unrest initially, we began to worry about the regime falling apart and loose chemicals, uh, just like we worried about loose nukes when the Soviet Union fell apart. Um, and in 2012, I visited Moscow with Senator Luger. It was his last trip to Russia as a US Senator. And we talked to the Russians about working together to destroy Syria's chemical weapons. Uh, through the non liver program. And we did get some traction in a few weeks. Well, actually, we were flying from Russia to Brussels, and the White uh, we received a message that, that uh, President Obama wanted to talk to Senator Luger because in Moscow, we did a, a breakfast with the American press pool, and there was a front page article in the New York Times, Luger proposes destroying Syria's chemical weapons with Russia. And Obama read the article and he wanted to talk to Luger about it. And about three weeks later, um, the Russian National Security um, Council Secretary General Petrushov 
and Tom Donovan, who was our national security advisor, set up a secret working group on Syria's chemical weapons that met secretly, mostly in Europe, over the course of a year to, um, to agree on what would be needed to destroy the Syrian chemical weapons stockpile. So then when, when Assad gassed with sarin uh, and killed 1,400 men, women, and children in August of, of 2013, under the threat of US and French military force, um, Assad uh, agreed to accede to the Chemical Weapons Convention and give up his chemical weapons stockpile. We, we launched a project um, that's in a book um, uh, called Red Line by Joby Ward that describes the whole history. Our intelligence was spectacular on this um, Syrian chemical weapons program and their stockpile. And we launched a big multinational project to remove that material um, from Syria and then destroy it on a US um, ready reserve ship uh, called the Cape Ray as it sailed around the Mediterranean. Uh, we destroyed uh, 1,300 tons of Syria's declared chemical weapons. Obviously, they kept a little bit behind that they didn't declare. We knew that at the time. Uh, but the strategic um, chemical weapons capability that Syria had at the time was completely uh, destroyed. We used to talk in the beginning of my career about five rogue states uh, that, that were developing weapons or are aspiring to acquire uh, weapons of mass destruction. And over the course of 30 years, that list got smaller and smaller. Um, Libya, after the last chemical weapons was destroyed, had no weapons of mass destruction. Um, their nuclear program was also dismantled. Iraq was successfully um, denuded its weapons of mass destruction in the 1990s under uh, UNSCOM. Um, uh, Syria with the destruction of its chemical weapons. Iran with the negotiation of the JCPOA, which hopefully we can, can get back to, um, was prevented from developing a nuclear weapon. And it was really the DPRK, North Korea, that's kind of the last of the rogue states that has nuclear weapons, chemical weapons, which they actually used at Kuala Lumpur Airport in an assassination, the VX, um, and a, a very advanced biological weapons program that we don't hear much about because they don't talk about it the way they do their missile and nuclear programs, which they put fancy videos on TV to celebrate. But because biological weapons and chemical weapons are banned, the uh, North Koreans don't, don't talk about it much. And then Russia has actually used banned chemical weapons in peacetime um, in an assassination attempt in Salisbury, England. And more recently, inside Russia against um, uh, opposition of member Navalny. Um, they used a very advanced fourth generation chemical weapon called Novichok. And um, some poor soul retrieved this little perfume model um, out of a dumpster in Salisbury that the two GRU uh, agents had, had tossed there. Um, his wife thought it was perfume and killed herself with the chemical weapons agent. Um, but that little bottle had 10,000 lethal doses of Novichok. Imagine if their intent had been different than just killing one person. Um, and if they were going to do this in peacetime, the possibilities today in Ukraine are really frightening. Um, and, and just yesterday, we heard of unconfirmed reports of the use of chemical weapons in Ukraine. Obviously, Ukraine doesn't have any chemical weapons. The Russians will try to blame it on them if they do use them. But let's hope they don't uh, cross that line and escalate to the use of weapons of mass destruction. In another case, um, there was a Moscow theater siege in 2002, and they used fentanyls, which we learned about from soil or from uh, clothing and biological samples from the victims because they used a little too much. They killed not just the hostage takers, 
but about a hundred of the hostages. Um, and and then in after I retired in 2015, there started to be news reports of fentanyls on the streets of the U.S. Is, is that the same fentanyl chemical weapon that we were working on in the Pentagon to defend against because we knew the Russian military had it? And sure enough, it's the same thing. That's what Mills is working on. It's the potential for terrorists to use fentanyl. In a, in a terrorist attack. It's really the first time in my lifetime you can buy on the black market a weapon of mass destruction. Um, so it's quite, quite concerning. It's one of the chemical weapons that Russia could use in Ukraine. They have a whole range from Novichok to Sarin and VX. Um, and maybe if they want to really try to blame it on Ukraine, they'll use something like the Syrians have chlorine or ammonia. Um, um, something that an industrial chemical that's widely available. Um, in my in my last uh, Pentagon job, um, serving as as Assistant Secretary of Defense for Nuclear Chemical and Biological Defense Programs, I also was Staff Director of the Nuclear Weapons Council. So I had uh, responsibility for the U.S. Uh, nuclear weapons arsenal, um, and I had the privilege of of doing a, a, a a flight as a co-pilot on the B-2 stealth bomber, which that's the total crew right there, two people. Um, we have a, a triad of nuclear weapons. We're about to invest um, almost $2 trillion over the next 30 years in, in modernizing those nuclear weapons. Um, <clears throat> these are the, the next generation cruise missiles, Russia and the United States. We worry a lot. I, I, the Council on Strategic Risks has done a lot of work on different types of nuclear weapons. We think some, like ballistic missiles, submarine or intercontinental ballistic missiles, are more stabilizing because you can see them launched and they're only nuclear. But these smaller systems, um, for example, cruise missiles, they're being used in Ukraine, the uh, Calibers. And, um, for conventional warfare, we use them on tomahawks from, from submarines and ships, but um, you can't tell if they're carrying a nuclear weapon. Uh, so there's that ambiguity problem that could lead to an escalation. So we think that arms control efforts should focus first and foremost on the most dangerous types and classes of nuclear weapons. And uh, with the situation in Ukraine, we talked about this earlier, it's, it's not a small chance that, that Putin will actually use um, will actually use a nuclear weapon, a so-called small nuclear weapon. And what is a small nuclear weapon? I think it's 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 the wrong term. You know, we 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 talk about low yield tactical nuclear weapons, like it's something very vanilla um, and antiseptic. But these are nuclear weapons. They're like the one. We dropped on Hiroshima. Um, maybe some of them are about half as big, but they are nuclear weapons, and the use of any nuclear weapon would cross a threshold after 76 years of no use of nuclear weapons. Uh, Putin has this very reckless policy, it's called uh, escalate to de escalate, whereby he would use one or two so called small nuclear weapons to get his adversary to stand down, to sue for peace. Um, and it's a reckless policy, and it's one that we've started to, to mimic over the last decade. And, and we've been emphasizing these smaller, so-called limited war fighting nuclear weapons. Um, and I think uh, that's weakened our deterrent. Because I don't want Putin to think that he'll get a proportionate small nuclear response if he crosses that threshold and uses you know, makes the first use of nuclear weapons. I wanted to think that we would potentially uh, respond with a strategic nuclear weapon um, on his homeland. Um, I think that's real, uh, real deterrence. So I'll, I'll close on this uh, picture. This is in Kiev in 2005, in one of those bio labs that you've been hearing about lately. Um, it's a public health laboratory. Um, the kitchen freezer behind me 
I have that tray of uh, vials of Bacillus anthracis, which is the bacteria that causes anthrax. And it's endemic there. I mean, they had a public health reason for, for, for working on some of these dangerous uh, diseases. And that's a concerned looking young senator um, <laughs> um, who, who looks much older. I have to say, I look the same, but he, <laughs> he looks older, older now. Um, so I just want to want to conclude by saying it's wonderful that, that so many of you are, are looking forward to a career in public service. Um, and whether it's as, as a, a scientist or a lawyer or a journalist, even journalists or public service. <laughs> um, there's so much we can do to make the world a better and safer place. So uh, first of all, thank you for your commitment to that. And, and just, I'll leave you with a thought, you know, the day after weapons of mass destruction are used in Ukraine or in the future, you know, what is it that for a lack of imagination we'll wish we had been doing to have prevented it? So that's your challenge. Thanks. We have time for some questions. Uh, you talked about how there were unde undeclared chemical and biological material. What is the chance in the former Soviet Union there were undeclared nukes that are not in Russia? I, I think it's practically zero. Um, I spent a lot of time in the region. Um, and one thing the countries do is keep track of nuclear weapons pretty well. Um, and, uh, and there have been rumors over the years about suitcase nukes, et cetera, et cetera, but we've never been able to confirm. I don't think there are any weapons that have gone missing. I do think there are nuclear materials that have gone missing, um, and that's a concern, and occasionally we see uh, see them appear in smuggling uh, routes, um, uh, mostly as samples. And they claim to have you know, more somewhere else, but I don't think you know, any actual nuclear weapons are missing. Uh, the first weapons that the Russians moved out of countries, um, the newly independent countries, were the tactical nuclear weapons, and we provided assistance. Uh, to help facilitate that. And then through the treaties, Kazakhstan, Ukraine, they uh, gave up all their nuclear weapons. Do you think otherwise? No, but I'm, I'm, I'm wondering whether the Russians might not use a nuclear weapon because they were afraid that the Ukrainians might not have given them all up. Yeah, that would just be propaganda. And this idea of a false flag, uh, that's what concerns me so much is that the Russians, the disinformation, it's just KGB style disinformation. It, it is um, it's part of their playbook. It's what they did in Syria. They, they, the regime used chemical weapons and then blamed it on the opposition to muddy the waters. And, and I think we're seeing a, a repeat of that. Why are they doing it? Are they doing it to build domestic support for the war? Are they doing it because they're preparing to actually use these weapons in Ukraine? Um, I don't know, and, and I certainly hope they don't. Yes. Hi, um, sorry to come in late. Uh, out of curiosity, is there any research or work being done in regards to the psychological operation and kind of countering that and being able to tell when it is actually an attack on a nuclear plant or a chemical agent in regards to analyzing the actual artillery groupings or the bracketing used by the Russian artillery units based off of their um, artillery capabilities and NATO um, logistics. Yeah, so our intelligence and NATO intelligence on the situation in Ukraine has been exquisite. And, and one of the things we've been doing, I think very effectively, has been revealing the intelligence uh, of, of Russian military plans and intentions in advance to try to preempt it. Um, would they use 
chemical weapons uh, in a more traditional like artillery? I guess I'm saying more so in the sense of, and pardon, I, I guess I didn't phrase it quite correctly. When you, or when anybody watched the movement from Russia into Ukraine for the first attack on a nuclear plant, it was, if you look at their artillery strikes leading up to that, the bracketing and the ripping, it's entirely different than the artillery that was used in the second push towards the nuclear plant, um, towards the, from the Ardessa region. Mm -hmm. That one was much more chaotic. That's, you know, much less organized, much less militant in a way. Sorry, I'm a, yeah. I'm a retired yeah. NATO officer, so that's why I was saying um, yeah. it's a very clear difference in the actual tactics and the actual level of training between the two units. So is that being used as an analysis tool? No, oh, I, I think it is. And, and Chernobyl is a huge, massive uh, landmass and target, and they used it as a transit point. It was just over the border from Belarus. But the Zaporizhia attack. Um, that one was disorganized, and it largely moved the mechanized units, mechanized infantry units in the <laughs> southern regions north so that they right. could protect that plant, which indicates psychological operations from the chaos and the non actual targeting of the plant in a strategic way while they were also conducting um, the abductions that day of the mayors for the first time with the children's hospitals being targeted for the first time two days before and orphanages in the south southern regions um, for the first time actually not letting children go. Yeah, it's all part of a terror campaign. Yeah. I mean, and it, it is the most brutal um, war. In terms of Zaporizhia, I'm still not sure. And the danger there is that is that the, the nuclear plant workers were, were held hostage at gunpoint, and and you know for a long time. And Russia didn't send a team to operate that nuclear plant. But what's what's the? I don't know if the intent is to cut off the electricity or you know, or to create more terror. Why they attack? Uh, uh, is operation is, is still not clear to me, but the uh, yeah the tactics are are obviously psychological to terrorize the civilian population. Could it be potentially that they attack that region so that it would take those mechanized use units like twenty eight OMBR that was in the Odessa region um, out of the southern region so they could conduct the psychological operations in which they shut off their own media because that was the day that they shut off Instagram, which was the last link that they had, which was when they abducted the mayors and then it appears to be began facilitating the abduction of orphans from those southern orphanages in that region, which the troops were pulled out of because of the nuclear plant. That doesn't make sense. So you've been studying this a lot more closely than I have. So what do you think? Um, so, huh. Um, I think absolutely. I was working with the military Ukrainian leaders in the area at that time, and I'm a research fellow that works directly for Dr. Allison Thompson um, regarding the Ukrainian war and international humanitarian relief. But specifically with the artillery, I was wondering if you guys saw the same thing with that, if that was a notable thing because I, I'm an artillery officer. I was highly, highly trained in artillery mm -hmm. and logistics um, and sustainment. And so when I watched the artillery unit for the first time go towards Chernobyl, terrifying. It was very, very, very fast. It was very intense. It was very, we knew what was happening. Like we all saw it coming. Mm -hmm. With the second one, it was slow, it was disjointed, and yes, you can blame PMCS or vehicles or the lack thereof. But regardless, the actual firing and the bracketing, the bracketing was non-existent. There was just, you know, fear. It's become a military operation to fear-based holding yeah. everybody else hostage because, well, we could launch a nuclear attack and then you know, governments, we have to protect our own schools. Yeah, and directly targeting soft targets, apartment buildings. Well, I schools. believe they may have intentionally uh, targeted the psychological ward of the Children's Hospital 
based off of the attempted um, perceived attempted abduction of the special needs orphans in the southern region of Ukraine. Um, because we did also get reports that week and why I was specifically brought on to this um, operation is because one of the orphans was already adopted by a Georgian family, you know. And when you mess with Georgia, one of their senators gets very, very mad and makes a lot of noise, but- I need to move on to another yeah, question, I'm sorry. Yeah, thanks. Cool. Yeah, I was, uh, I was taking a road trip through uh, Uzbekistan several years back, and uh, we had to try to drive that island it's all dried up now, but you hit some pretty sandy parts. Anyway, the locals were saying that a bunch of that stuff was buried, that was dug up, that yeah. was missing. Can you touch on that at all? Or it's... Yeah, there's a lot of lore. Okay. Um, <laughs> lore. And, you know, about Super Plague and all of this. Yeah. We did dig up the 11 pits and then thoroughly decontaminate it using hydrochloride and, um, in order to prevent the possibility that you know, terrorists would get their starter cultures from. Yeah, they said like there were just they buried a bunch of barrels out there, and people went out there and dug some barrels up. And I was like, this sounds wild. How come? Yeah. Not heard of it? <laughs> yeah. So there's a lot of uh, of lore. Okay. If you've been there, you know how hot it gets. Yeah. yeah. And it's one of the reasons that the AW test range of the Soviet Union was put there. It's remote, but it's also hot. So anything that was on the surface. Was killed. I mean, it, it's um, there's no threat anymore. Because they were saying, like, oh, there's a hundred, there's hundred tons of, of anthrax. There, on. there, there were. Yeah. It was buried yeah. in those eleven pits. Yeah. We found the pits, by the way. Uh, the defector told us about this. Yeah. Then we went back and looked, re-looked at the historical satellite oh. photos, yeah. and were able to geo geolocate the pits. And so when we visited in '95, we did deep core samples right at the spot of the pits, and that's how we um, found the answer. I feel better. <laughs> we have a question back here in the corner. If, if you wake the baby, I'm a absent grandpa, so I'll walk, I'll walk the baby. You know, as soon as I start speaking loudly, he's going to jump and cry at me. Um, thank you so much for being here. I'm curious if you can talk a little bit about marketing counterproliferation to U.S. senators and representatives and how we get this legislation passed without, I guess, causing a hysteria. Um, Bills and I kind of worked on a project together last semester about uh, vaporizing fentanyl and using uh, agriculture drugs, right, to, to dispense that. And you can make that whole presentation and then you just keep mothers up all night holding their babies. Um, yeah. And how do, you, how do you suggest trying to get our, our senators and our representatives to vote on things like this and prioritize it without just causing hysteria? Yeah, it's... it's it's hard. You have to strike the balance. You don't want to put ideas in, in bad guys' heads either. Um, you don't want to create panic, but you can't not talk about these things because then there won't be any action. You won't get resources to counter it. Um, we, we work a lot with educating uh, members of Congress on these issues and, and you know, the specific committees that be involved in, in, in these uh, uh, programmatic responses. Um, the intelligence community briefs, um, um, it gives classified briefings on these topics. Uh, there's been more interest lately, and, and even before Ukraine, because of COVID on, on the BW side, um, the fentanyl one, it's, it's hitting so many states so hard that there is a lot of political uh, energy to, to do something, but on the uh, on the counterterrorism side, which is what you're focused on, um, it's hard. It, it's a it's a balance, right? You don't want to you don't want to scare people. Hopefully, I didn't scare anybody. Today. <laughs> well, if I could just say, Niels has research that he's doing for me. Um, when I was we were bouncing it off, he bounced it off me and Andy. And I actually. Uh, Asked or he asked if we could show it to some other people. And one of the groups I showed it to was the Texas Department of Public Safety. And I was a little worried that we were maybe a little bit over the edge because it's so specific, but they were very interested in it. But the point I would make to a policy school student is what we want to jump up and down and say, do something, Congress, but what is it that you do? So developing effective countermeasures and, and coming up with what would actually work is what we're supposed to do here. And then and then we can, you know, kind of look for that support. But 
Uh, it's a very tough problem that he's describing. That's true. Yeah, that's actually what I wanted to talk about. Um, first of all, thank you so much for coming out to talk to us. And I recognize it's a little bit of a broad question to bring up, but what would you say are the next crucial steps for the next generation of policymakers um, to pursue in order to counter the proliferation of nuclear, biological, and chemical weapons? Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, I, I've given at least one example of somebody who made a career at this. I mean, there, there's a lot, so, so much that needs to be done. Um, uh, and I hope I hope I left with feeling that it's tractable. That we can do specific things to actually reduce these threats, but we need regional experts, we need linguists, we need negotiators, lawyers, we need scientists. And on the bio side, a lot of the answer is, is from our S and T community because we. Unlike nuclear weapons, we really can make bioweapons obsolete um, by investing in, in, in defensive measures. Um, but um, working, a lot of these WMB issues are government, are issues that are handled mostly by governments. So going into public service, and um, whether it's as an analyst to help understand it better or a policymaker. Um, you know, there's the Defense Threat Reduction Agency. That's all they do is countering WMB. It's 2,000 people. Um, there are, you know, the Presidential Management Fellowship Program that many of you know about. It's a great way to get into the executive branch. Um, but develop the expertise and then on the job training. <laughs> yeah, I didn't have, you know, deep expertise on, on weapons of mass destruction before I started working for the government, but because of my experiences, I, I learned a few things along the way. Um, sure. Question. One, two, three. Well, well, one, two, three. <laughs> Why don't we okay. start again? So I always have to say, when I imagine the case of a country that has all the economic and technological means to acquire weapons of mass destruction. What are the incentives for that country not to acquire? Yeah. Considering the fact that it's not just the US that has these weapons, but also North Korea. Yeah. So I used to, when I was briefing on bio threats, I put up a political map of the world and, and you know, with countries in different colors. And I would say that the countries, the colored countries, um, have capability to develop biological weapons because every country has that capability. The good news is very few countries are pursuing them. Um, it's really Russia, North Korea. Those are the two that we're sure of. And then we have some concerns about China and some of the dual use work they do. And that's an example of bio. In nuclear, you know, we've, we've kept the number much smaller than, than we anticipated. There's the materials issue, which you can control. It's hard to hide a nuclear weapons program. Um, but I mean, the bottom line is you want governments that that focus on economic prosperity for their populations and, and don't invest in these uh, you know, divert resources in these weapons that they don't need that aren't going to make them safer. Um, yeah. Could you relate your project Sapphire to the nuclear um, pro pro proliferation treaty um, in terms of what are the success stories of any for that treaty? Now, India and Pakistan never signed it, so they were free to develop their programs. Iran and the Shah do sign it, and I don't believe the Islamic Republic has ever withdrawn Iran from the agreement. So are there success stories for that treaty or not? Oh, definitely. Yeah, a lot. Um, I, I, I have a friend who's a, a Swedish scientist who was hired out of his PhD program to work on Sweden's nuclear weapons program. And then like a couple months after he started, the prime minister canceled the program. So the fact that we only have you know, less than two handfuls of countries that have nuclear weapons, that's a success. Um, we, we just need to keep at it. You know, let's hope we can 
denuclearize um, North Korea. It, it probably isn't going to happen quickly, but we need to keep that as the goal. Um, and India and Pakistan, let's let's not have nuclear armed cruise missiles like the one that the conventional one that flew off course into from, Pac from India to Pakistan a couple of weeks ago. It would have been big news if not for all this other news um, about Ukraine. Um, so I, I think the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty has been a big success, but some of these norms are breaking down, especially the use of chemical weapons uh, in recent years. And so we need to do everything we can to, to strengthen those norms and restore the taboo that um, unfortunately has broken down and weakened. <clears throat> Going back to your time in Kazakhstan, the former Soviet submariner yeah. who offered to sell you material, That's it. did yeah. he do that because he knew you were American and he wanted it to go into safekeeping, or was he just trying to mm. find a buyer? <laughs> yeah, that, that's probably a combination. You know, people are complicated. <laughs> yeah. um, I think he was responsible for the whole town. Like every, it was a factory town. And he couldn't pay his workers, and um, so he, he wanted money to support his his community, his people. Um, he died, and, and not long after the, the project of, of uh, cancer caused probably they also produced beryllium uh, at the factory, which is is you know. Pretty nasty stuff. They had, had had a big accident. Um, to this day, I don't know what. What I don't know is, was he pursuing? Was he freelancing? This was uh, um, kind of a black market thing at the start, and and then it became a government to government thing. And I I worked. I had to bring it into the government to government channel in a way that still protected him as the source of the information. And it took months and it was complicated. But what, what I don't know is, did the president of Kazakhstan know that he was, or somehow approve his approach to me or not? You know, did that come later? But he was promoted to governor of the region after the operation. <laughs> so, yeah, so I don't know. It's one of the things that he took to the grave with him. I, I just don't know. Um, there was a book about Kazakhstan that I think got it wrong, just over, it just came out, Atomic Step. Really good book, um, but simplified it as if, like, yeah, the government of Kazakhstan wanted to get rid of this stuff, and so they approached this diplomat. And, it wasn't like that. It was, there were many, many layers to the thing, but parts that I still am not sure about. We take about two more, maybe. I was yes. wondering what, I guess, got you interested in public service and got started, and maybe what are some of the early experiences that prepared you for tackling these really serious issues. Oh, my. I missed that <laughs> Uh yeah, too much time in bars in high school. I, I don't know. Um, um, it was a little unusual. Um, you know, most of the people where I grew up didn't go to work for the government. There, there a couple of us. Um, honestly, I mean, there were bad things happening in the world. There, there were there was terrorism was happening, and and. Um, I wanted to be involved in, in countering that. And the way to do that was to work for the government. Um, and, then, and then I just got deeper and deeper with each assignment. Um, it was a great, a great privilege. But, but it looks like, if you looked at my resume, it looks like it was well conceived and planned, <laughs> but it, it wasn't. It was, it was serendipity. Um, and, and I was lucky that I was able to focus on one subject 
or three subjects for so long. And that's pretty unusual. Usually they bounce you around and you know, you're doing all kinds of different things. Yeah. When you just pass by somebody and they say, or they're talking about like, oh, I'm really worried that Russia might use use in Ukraine. What's like that 10 second response that you could just say to them, like when they have that concern? Like <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I'm worried too. <laughs> no, I, I think it's realistic. It's consistent with their doctrine. It's the paradox. The worse they do on the military battlefield, the more likely it is that they'll resort to one of these uh, horrible weapons. So, yeah, it's it's a serious worry. I, I I have been saying that this is the worst crisis of my lifetime. It doesn't feel that way. It's springtime and in Austin. <clears throat> Yeah, everything seems fine, but this is, this is worse in many ways than the Cuban Missile Crisis. Um, there were no bullets flying during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Mm -hmm. yeah, last question. Yeah, kind of tapping it. While we've been sitting here, uh, Putin came out and said that he considers peace talks to be a dead end and that the war will continue until it reaches completion. And I guess my question is like, what kind of policy responses do we have if Russia, a member, a member of the UN Security Council, actually uses chemical weapons. If the reports are true, what happened yesterday? I mean, what kind of responses do we actually have at this point? If he escalates, and, and I'm not convinced that these reports okay. are credible, but we'll, we'll figure it out. Um, then we have to escalate back. Obviously, we don't have chemical weapons, so we're not going to go there. Uh, but there's there's a lot more pain that we can deliver um, militarily in, in terms of the sophistication of support, in terms of cyber um, against Russia itself. And we've been holding back. So if he chooses to escalate and uses weapons of mass destruction, I think when President Biden says there will be severe consequences, not specified, that we don't want to say in advance what we would do, but I think the international response and the NATO response will be much tougher than what we've seen today. And that we're happy to do. Thank you so much, Andy.